Okay, good evening to all. Good to see different familiar faces coming on. Uh, I have some guests with me tonight live uh, allowed to introduce. So um, because of the conference this week here at BJMBC, we have a number of people that are here in town. So uh, a number of them joining me here personally in live and then others will come later on tonight, uh, Lord willing. So anyway, very much, very much excited about what we're gonna cover in our information, but I'm very much excited about our guests and uh, looking forward to the time we're going to spend. It's going to be good, good quality time, I'm confident. Um, what I think I'll do is I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker and let you know a little bit about him and then see if I can have a volunteer to pray for us. Um, so actually, let's see if uh, Brother Brian, it says your first time joining us here tonight, I'll call on you to pray for us. Is that okay? Uh, Brother Lambu is a friend of mine and a, fellow, uh, a, a grad student and then also a worker here, or a student here at BJBC, and then just a fellow believer. And uh, very, very thankful for the fellowship we share, very thankful for the uh, testimony he's had here and the ministry he's had. So I'll ask him to pray for us in just a little bit. And now looking across, I see other familiar faces. I won't introduce each one of you tonight, but uh, as we go forward as a class, we get to know each other. And look forward to building those relationships as time goes by. Okay, introducing our speaker, and then Brother Brian, uh, if you can pray for us after that. Uh, so the plan tonight actually is to work together. Um, I'm working together, Lord willing, with our speaker here, and we'll just basically have a conversation. Um, we're going to introduce the topic, apologetics, and what is it, kind of the general, say, what's the general topography of the topic? And how does it work out? Um, what kind of things do you have to know in order to be prepared to do apologetics or at least be familiar with? So these are some of the things we're going to discuss. Um, he is related to me. He's my brother-in-law, so married my wife's sister. And uh, then as far as his education and training goes, we were together in school at BJNU. Um, one of my one of the memories that sticks in my mind is going through advanced Greek grammar together. That was an experience uh, with Dr. Lee, very mentally stretching. Um, then after those years were done, he was in the ministry for, how many years were you in Charlotte? Yes, seven? Uh, eight and a half. Eight and a half. Yeah. Um, during that time also, he got a PhD in apologetics and worldview from Southern Seminary, dissertation was on Pascal and uh, Pascal's use of what's called abductive reasoning, basically um, a reasoning or an argument that says, what, what can explain this world apart from a God and apart from you know, the apologetic program that Pascal is laying out, what explains our human condition? And uh, in particular, then that went into the, the image of God. So some really fascinating stuff in that study. Um, Pascal may come up in our discussion here tonight. So that's his background. Uh, therefore, his degree is just right in the middle of what we're discussing. And I, I asked him any way that I could possibly get his time to come into this course. Um, I was really begging for it because I, I really want his input here. So that comes at some personal sacrifice for him because he's leaving uh, just in a matter of hours, as in when we're done with this class, to walk out the door and get in a truck and his family's moving across the country uh, and he's going to be taking a church in a new location pretty far away. So he's got a big trip, got a big move and uh, Brother Lambu, if you can pray for um, uh, Brother Jonathan for all fall to have safety as he's traveling after this and then the big transition as they're moving and starting out in the ministry. So <laughs> major changes for them and he very kindly gave his time to spend this time with us today, in spite of all of that going on. Okay, that's all I will say there. Uh, if we can get a, we'll get an opening prayer in the Brother Lambu, and then after that, we will jump straight into kind of introducing the shape of the course and talking about apologetics from there. Okay, let's pray. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the peace you give us through this world. Please that we know you and also we know that we will go to the heaven in the future. Thank you for uh, this peace that now we also, the great opportunity we have to in this class to learn 
how to share, how to talk, how to defend our faith through the gospel. And uh, please help us to, to uh, in this class, to um, have the clear mind, clear heart, and also to, uh, to understand what we, uh, we study and continue to study in the next uh, two months. We also pray that please use uh, the teachers, the um, for those who will speak this day and also in the future, please help them to have the wisdom from you that they can share clearly and also understanding for us. We pray for the student. So please help us to be faithful and also to um, continue to have the heart of learning and also to encourage the other. Thank you for the opportunity you give us this night and also in the future, please really help us to you this time to be a real time for us to continue to learn from you and also to helping to the others when they know you. Please uh, use the peace that we have now uh, for us to also to encourage and also to give the peace to those who don't know you yet in the world. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me do just a minute or two. I don't want to take too long with this because I want to use our speaker's time well. Um, but let me take a second or two, I'll say a second instead of a minute, to make sure you're clear on how this works with the Moodle page. And by that, I'm referring to, I'll drop the link in in the chat for you to see. I'll, maybe I'll do that, or I can do this now. Um, what you'll see there in the chat is the page that we use for communicating about the course. Okay, so as you're wondering about different specifics of the course and how that works, as you're needing to find certain assignments, this is the place to go to. And um, that will be helpful to you just to be able, especially be able to get your homework assignments. So if you go to that page, uh, you're going to find there the necessary uh, information links to actually a homework assignment for today. Um, I did not require you because this is the first lecture. It's not really fair to ask you to do an assignment before the class starts. But I would ask you to finish this assignment by the end of this week. I set the deadline for the end of this week. And so the deadline Saturday, uh, you have to read the chapter. And I'm doing this, those of you that have taken courses previously, I'm changing the way we do things a bit. Um, in the pre past, I've just put up the homework assignment, kind of left it to you to read it. I'm asking you here to go ahead and fill out a quiz and to, to give me a yes or a no and a percentage. I read it 100% thoroughly or 75% or so forth. And that, that figures into your final grade. So um, please do make sure you get that. And there's a time limit on it. Like I said, make sure you get it done before the end of this week. And then you'll go in there on the Moodle page following the link I gave you fill that quiz out and so forth. Each lecture expect to have some kind of assignment. Sometimes we're going to have reading, Sometimes we're going to have um, like a, more of a, a, uh, an essay type of format. So it's going to depend. But in each case, uh, I want you to be definitely prepared um, to have done that assignment. And the more that you do with those assignments before you come into class, I think the more you'll benefit from the lecture itself. Okay. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say here. If you're interested in kind of, if you're interested in the details of upcoming teachers, you can also get that information that's also on the Moodle page. And so clicking through is going to show you what the upcoming teachers and lectures are going to be. And that, again, helps you be prepared a bit. OK, uh, in order to use the time of our teacher, I'm going to jump straight in, if that's OK. Um, so Dr. Thruffle, thanks again for coming in. Thanks again for joining us. Um, I've got a number of different questions I want to get through, and we'll just do the best we can. Uh, a ton to cover here. The first thing I'm doing is just to ask this, or I mean, let's just basically we'll just chat about this a little bit. Uh, defining apologetics. What is apologetics in the first place? Um, I'm holding the book. This is the book that I gave you your assignment out of for today. Um, Frank starts out and in his first chapter, he's going to do some discussion of apologetics. What is it? And basically the definition he gives, we may define it as the discipline that teaches, teaches Christians how to give a reason for their hope. Um, he's basing that nicely, I think, off of 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, which is uh, this, this statement. It's, it kind of gets used as a, a programmatic statement for uh, some apologetics programs. Uh, the, I, the statement, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord, 
always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And so from that, he's given this definition. We take it as the discipline that teaches Christians how to give a reason for their hope. Um, Dr. Thrubbani, what what, how does that strike you? Any thoughts there? You know, I'll give you a second just with that or anything. Uh, what do you think there so far? Yeah, well, actually, I wanted to say something about my schedule today. Um, actually, okay. <laughs> so I'm actually moving tomorrow, but I'm going to pick up our rental truck today. So I didn't want to cause any undue panic from anybody there in the room. So I'm a little more relaxed. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's all good. I, I made it a little over dramatic. I mean, it, the, the narrative of you leaving like five minutes after the class was done, cleaning out the parking lot to get into a movie truck was more exciting, but we'll let this go. I, okay. I would have loved, I would have loved to keep that narrative, that let that narrative stand. But I just, uh, honesty took over. But yeah, so as far as that definition, you know, it struck me as a little bit odd that Frame would uh, describe it as the discipline that teaches Christians how to give the reason, a reason for their hope. I think he's thinking in terms of a classroom setting and apologetics. But often when I think of apologetics, I think of actually the act of communicating to unbelievers or even myself or other believers to give evidence for the reason of their hope. But so it's, it's kind of like he's framed it within a didactic setting. Um, I, I think what he's getting there is that if, even if you were to clip out the discipline that teaches and then just focus on the Christians giving a reason for their hope, I think that would focus a little more uh, specifically on, on it. It's a really generic, a, a general kind of definition um, because it presupposes a bunch of, or, or it, it gives a whole lot of room for specifically how are you going to give a reason uh, for their hope? What what would satisfy the reasons of unbelievers or the minds of unbelievers and their expectations of a reason for their hope? What kind of evidence would um, be sufficient to establish that reason? So I, I think as it goes, is a good definition. Um, I, I like to think of it in terms of apologetics being commending the Christian faith on a number of levels in terms of its truth, uh, in which you're going to have to appeal to people's sense of logic and reasoning, uh, in terms of its um, even moral excellence, um, that, that whole aspect of the morality uh, and goodness of Christianity is often overlooked in these highly academic and intellectual debates about what, what apologetics really is. Because, you know, w when you're in an academic setting, you tend to focus on logic and arguments as opposed to the commendation that comes out of a life that is truly sanctified by the Lord. And I think in the context of first Peter three, he is saying, okay, it starts out with sanctifying the Lord Christ as Lord in your hearts. And then what's going to flow out of that is giving a reason of the hope that is within you. But I kind of see that the character of a believer is prior to the, uh, the rationality that's, that he, that believer presents, um, which is just, I think, an argument for a more, um, a definition of apologetics that would encompass the moral side too. Um, so that, that's kind of, that's be, that'd be off the, just off the, the top of my head, a response to that definition. That's nice. Um, a couple of things that popped into my mind there. I <laughs> think that's great and very attentive, um, very observant. As far as, okay, in his definition, apologetics is the discipline. He keyed it, of course, right in to be this, probably this um, closely analyzed. But it's, you're right, absolutely right. I mean, it's putting it in automatically as a discipline within the academic curricula, right? Um, so, and the irony is, so he's he's working hard to derive it from 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. The irony is, I like what you said too, in the context of 1 Peter 3, you know, it's following an extended argument that is to say your life is your best argument for Christianity. And so be the best husband you can be, be the best wife you can, be the best neighbor, be the best citizen you can possibly be. So that when people say, why is your life so unusual, then you have a prepared answer to give them. Um, which is so much, so much broader. And I want to build this idea when we get to a further topic, so much broader than we normally think of apologetics like we normally have it penned so academic and as the discipline strictly speaking versus the whole picture of, of my life yeah yeah, yeah. And, and if i could just uh expand on that just a little bit i like to think of apologetics in terms of what actually am i trying to accomplish uh, what, what's the goal of this 
And, and the goal, you know, is in first Peter three fifteen. you have your, the goal is to answer a question um, that that's given to you. Actually, it's interesting. The goal is not necessarily to convert the believer on the spot, <laughs> you know, uh, the, un, sorry, to convert the unbeliever on the spot that the, you see is the goal is a proper, proper response, but that's going to differ depending on the person that you're talking to. Like I think of, uh, the church I'm going to. So there is a, a Mormon uh, church right next to it. And I'm thinking, okay, some of these people, what they may not need is more arguments, but what maybe they need is to see someone's life radically different than their own um, because they've heard those arguments over and over and over again. Um, and that's not, they've been, I don't know, brainwashed, if you will. That's not going to convince them. Um, but if you give them like a loaf of steaming hot bread on a cold day or something like that, like that's going to uh, make a difference in their life. Now, I'm not saying that you can convert someone. This is not just a like a social gospel sort of thing um, that you can convert people by merely without words. That's that's not what this is. Um, but it is saying that there is so much more to commending the Christian faith than just presenting arguments for it. Yeah, at the least like. The, um, the relational side of it is opening the door. It's, you're going to have to get the word sooner or later, but at least the relational side opens the door for it to happen. And, and can I so, just interject too? Yeah. That it's interesting that even before, in the beginning of that chapter, when it's talking about wives and their husbands, it's talking about a wife with an unbelieving husband, that he may be one without a word. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this whole context of, of commending the Christian faith is broader than just speaking. It requires actions too. That's great. Okay. Um, I, what, basically, the whole theme of this very first section is going in this direction, basically broadening out our definition of apologetics. Um, so Frame gives three, three roles for apologetics, and I saw something like this in uh, Bowman and Boa. They did a similar thing, which is a, another book um, that I used for prep, prep for this. I saw this. They did, he did a similar thing here in five views on apologetics. Um, Who's the editor, Callan? Um, so anyway, just a couple of different books that I was I was thumbing through, but uh, kind of a threefold thing: um, a defense towards unbelievers, an offense towards unbelievers, and then apologetics is confirmation for believers. Um, I kind of I, I'm going to throw this up here, and then I'll see what you uh, what you think, Doctor Thorfall. Um, so I, I've kind of played around with a little bit, thinking of it as a quadrant. And I don't know if I don't know how reasonable or doable that is, but I'd like to kind of uh, I'd like to get your input on it. Um, give me just a second. So uh, let me pull it up on here, and then I'll show it to you. Um, so if I did have unbelievers and believers, and if I also have an offense and a defense role like those two sides, then the question I'm wondering is: it fair? Is it reasonable? Something, some such thing to think of this as like you could have an offense towards both believer and unbeliever, a defense towards both believer and unbeliever. Um, just kind of how would you interact with what I'm putting up here? Any thoughts there or anything that strikes you? My concept here, let me explain, I should explain further. Um, when I'm talking about a negative side as far as a defense, the idea of this is an unbeliever comes to you and they say, you know, the Trinity is nonsensical. Um, so this is absurd, or I found an error in the Bible, and this, there's no point in this, believing this, this messed up book. Okay, so an apologetic role would be to answer that negative. That's you know, defensive, so we're defending the Christian view. Positive, uh, the offense for an unbeliever, is that you're actually stepping forward and saying, now let me show you not only is the Christian view not absurd, it's a reasonable idea, but let me show that yours is not, <laughs> or let me show that you really should be, you should be considering Christianity as a superior way to understand the world. Um, so that's kind of, I think, a more standard idea, the negative and the positive roles, defensive and offensive roles in respect to unbelievers. But I'm coming down a quadrant, and here's where I'm kind of thinking of this idea. I don't know so much on this last quadrant, the bottom right side, how much I really take that all that seriously, whatever. But what I, what does matter to me here is the idea that even for a believer, I do need a role of ap apologetics in my life, because as a human, um, believer or unbeliever, I'm a human, 
And so questions do come to my mind and I do come across things that might trouble me. And so from time to time, I'm going to need something defensive in the sense of I come across something in scripture that looks like it doesn't make sense. And apologetics would have one role of helping me understand that or defend it. Positive or offensive, I think even for a believer, I want that at times uh, as a way of confirming for me or um, strengthening my confidence in the faith that I hold. So anyway, uh, Dr. Thorfall, how does that strike you? Any thoughts there? Any discussion we want to have off that? You know, I think that the distinction between defensive and offensive or negative and positive apologetics, it's a good distinction um, because on the one hand, you are uh, answering specific objections to, uh, to Christianity in terms of its uh, rationality, uh, it, in terms of its sufficiency of its evidence. Um, and I like the example that you gave. A great one is the Trinity. Okay, this doesn't seem to be, this doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, the, the only thing I would wonder about the quadrant is that sometimes I don't, I don't know that there is a, ma a huge distinction between the kinds of questions that believers ask and the kinds of questions that unbelievers ask. Um, I, I'm, I find myself wondering some of the same things that unbelievers would ask. Now, granted, I've already come to faith in Christ. What I'm seeking is not, so that it, there is a distinction in this sense. I'm seeking for my faith to be bolstered by reason. Um, I'm not seeking for faith to be added to my reason. You know, it's, it's not like I'm saying, hey, uh, I'm not going to believe until this makes sense to me. I've, I'm, I'm committed to it, all right? I want to understand how it makes sense. So I, in that sense, certainly there is a massive difference between an, a believer and an unbeliever. Um, but I think it's a little blurred. It's... Um, there are many things that believers find themselves doubting that unbelievers also find themselves doubting. But you're right. I think it's, I think both unbelievers and unbelievers need positive and negative apologetics. So I, I think that's a helpful grid. Um, I like the, I, what you just said, that blurred, and I'm, I'm a hundred percent signing up for that. Um, there was a, there was a section in uh, the first chapter of what is Keller's, the book that was like a New York, it was just the really big book. Reason for God. Reason for God. No, sorry. Uh, I think, it, was it Reason for God? I don't know. We could Google it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of this. Anyway, Tim Keller, um, <laughs> his apologetics book. Um, so his uh, like a major book and it was, it was very, very uh, extensively read. But um, he made the case in chapter one, or he just made a comparison in chapter one to say, one of the ways that we ought to think uh, about Christians and apologetics is not to view ourselves as different from this. Um, he said, he made a, an analogy, a Christian who has never struggled with hard questions would be like a human body or physical body that has no antibodies in it. In other words, you have no immunity because you've never faced any illness before. And I, I really, I really like that. There's maybe a, a, a pressure um, that we're not supposed to ask hard questions in public or something. Um, and so maybe those things never get aired because you're just keep your head down and don't ask those questions. But we ought to discuss some of this stuff. And I want to argue something like there's something deeply healthy about saying I'm not just in this because I want a nice religion that I do on Sunday so that me and my family are going to, you know, be nice, responsible neighbors or something like as though any religion would do as long as it helps keep me nor moral or something. But that it's a real genuine faith commitment. I actually believe this stuff is true, meaning true, meaning actually happened, like real. And if that's, if that's the case, if I take my faith that seriously, that I think Jesus died and rose again in the real world, meaning this world, then I'm asking hard questions, uh, in some cases, things that might make me uncomfortable initially. But I should actually be concerned about the truth value of my faith. I mean, I shouldn't just like put that away as like, well, that, yeah, just be a good Sunday school person. But I should care about the truth value of my faith, which means sometimes probing some hard questions. Uh, thoughts there? Uh, yeah, that's, that's really good. And I'll, as far as apologetics to believers <clears throat> and I'll give you a specific example when I was reading through the book of Exodus with my kids so we're talking their ages are four six and eight 
and I'm reading through Exodus, and God is telling Moses that he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. <laughs> and now, Dr. Arnold and I have had some discussions about this. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some back and forth. It was good. It was, it was stimulating and helpful for me. Yeah, so God, God tells Moses, um, you're going to show these signs to the people of Israel. He's not going to let you go at first because I'm going to harden his heart. And immediately my eight-year-old says, why would God do that? Okay, immediately there is an opportunity for apologetics. Why? Because in a sense, I'm having to come to God's defense. <laughs> because in her mind, that is immoral. It seems, it seems unfair and not right for God to plan ahead of time to harden another man's heart in such a way that will cause such devastation to his country, to his nation. Now, the question is, Okay, so my Anna Grace is an eight-year-old. She's a believer as far as she's made a profession of faith. So what I'm doing is not trying to convince her, oh, you can believe in God. You should believe in God because he, he's, he's really good. No, she already believes in God. She just wants to understand how her, her previous understanding of God is being omnibenevolent, although she's not going to use that term. It can be squared with this idea that God would harden someone's heart. Okay, so how do I go about doing that? Well, and, and here's where you get into a pol the controversies about polyvetic methods. On the one hand, I could try to demonstrate that God is conforming to her expectations of goodness. <laughs> you know, like God is really good because maybe he didn't really mean that or the way that it came across is different to us. So I'm trying to preserve her pristine view of God. Or I could say, ultimately, you know, I tried to explain a few things like, you know what? Pharaoh actually had a responsibility. Pharaoh was hardening his heart as well. Uh, Pharaoh had had defied God and said, who is the Lord? But ultimately, I had to say, you know, the most important thing in the world is that the creator of the world gets all the glory and God can do what he wants to do. So I'm trying to set the discussion on God's own terms rather than on our understanding of of what goodness ought to be. Um, and so there there right right there you have it. it's an interesting um, case study of how we go about doing apologetics to believers. I think that would be would it be negative apologetics in the believers quadrant of your uh, square of your quadrant is that right is that you are you're trying to say okay am i going to presuppose um the the truth of god's word or are you going to presuppose uh that my standards of morality are right um and so anyway that that's just an example of doing apologetics to believers yeah but that is was that well, that is kind of a test case i, I mean I, I just do wonder like so we recognize that whole generations of young people come up to our homes and they, they, they leave. Um, are we selling these people short by not answering the hard questions? And they, ha they have brains and they are asking the questions and it's tempting to just be like, no, don't ask that question or something. Um, yeah. I understand that from the parental standpoint, you sometimes get asked questions that you don't know the answer to. Would it be more helpful for, it would be more helpful for us to say, I don't know in this case. It's, be honest about it um and and then let's let's try to help where we can answer these questions so anyway it, very interesting some of this these pieces are coming all the way around and touching every area of life aren't they um every part of theology and even practice yeah um okay there's so many things i want directions i want to go here um but let me do this uh what about that you gave you gave the example there it could be tempting to just say um you know, you conform God's standards of goodness to what Anna Grace expects or to what we expect. Um, some people would have a reservation about apologetics, and it's it's a fallacy. It's an etymological fallacy. But they hear in the word apologetics an apologized idea. Um, and so the whole assumption about apologetics is that I'm coming in and I'm trying to do that. Basically, I'm going around begging people to please believe in, please believe in my God and please believe in my worldview. Um, and Spurgeon has a comment, something to the effect, you know, defend the Bible or defend God. I would sooner defend a lion than defend the Bible or defend God. Well, there's something there. He's on to something, isn't he? Um, so, I mean, a, a, a pusillanimous, a weak, um, a frightened kind of apologetic that says, please believe my worldview. Uh, there's nothing appealing about that. I wouldn't want to believe that regardless. Um, just talk to me about that. Like, what would be even an attitude or a, um, a disposition that an apologist should have coming into a discussion? 
Yeah, that's that's a good point. It's unfortunate that the word itself has what has come to mean in the English language to express um, regret about something, to apologize. You know? It doesn't have to do with apologizing, obviously, but to presenting a case uh, to commend the Christian faith. Um, so, I, let me just make sure I understand the question right. Are you are you talking about maybe so someone who understands the propositions of the Christian faith feels a little bit squeamish about actually presenting some of these to an unbeliever uh, as they are, because it seems like man, that's kind of uh, that's kind of hard to swallow. So maybe I could tone this down a little bit. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Or actually the direction I was going more would be, I use some jargon here, but um, kind of a popular level fideism where, you know, a, a person saying apologetics as a discipline is bad. It's broken. It just, let's just get out there and let them have it. Um, you know, but okay, I'm not going to go in and be pusillanimous about it. I'm just going to go out there and, and use, I'm going to go out and use straight verses, um, which is great. Using verses is always a good idea. But yeah, I mean, how, how does that strike you? Yeah, um, I mean, I, just a few responses to that. So yeah, there is sometimes a sense that, okay, apologetics is just being fighty and argumentative. And I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell people, hey, believe. Um, but actually, the Bible itself, which is the, the document, of, the documents upon which our Christian faith is founded, is a very apologetic book. <laughs> um, for example, um, even Luke acts. So the, the first two volumes that, that Luke wrote, uh, you read what Luke is trying to do. In many cases, he's trying to demonstrate that both Jesus and Paul were law abiding citizens. Um, why is that important to Luke's case? He's trying to show that the Christian faith is not about uh, revolting against the government, that it could actually coexist Although our allegiance as Christians is to a higher authority, we must obey God rather than men. Yet at the same time, this is also in Luke, what Luke wrote uh, about Jesus when they asked him about whether he should pay the tax. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the, th the things that are God's. So you see, uh, it, that's an apologetic theme. It's a, it's a politically oriented, but it's meant to demonstrate to the Roman readers of those volumes that this is not about revolting against the Roman government. So it, Luke Acts has a very apologetic thrust. Uh, even the book of John has an apologetic thrust. In the beginning was the word, the logos. That would have resonated immediately with his Greek readers, this idea of this uh, platonic uh, sense of primal order. And he's saying, hey, it's not just this impersonal primal order that brings... Um, out of chaos, something that we could understand. This logos that you understand is a philosophical category is a person, and he's the son of God, and he's coming to the world. He's coming to f in the flesh. So, all, all even the documents. What I'm trying to say is this: the very documents on which the Christian faith are are based are, are speak into the worldviews of people that don't believe it in a way that's meant to convince them. So, if the Bible were really were merely what you're describing is this kind of popular level fideism. All it would be composed of is over and over again saying, repent and believe, repent and believe, repent and believe. But it's more than that. There are reasons as to why we should repent and believe. Um, even the way that God presents himself in the Old Testament, why, why would God uh, talk about all these judgments and talk about his mercy unless it were not a way to compel his people to say, hey, come to me. Let us reason together. Um, so, yeah, the, the whole tenor of the Bible is very much uh, speaking right to the objections of the human mind. That kind of pushes me down to a future topic here. Um, I was a, I was a little I was kind of shocked working through just the data, the biblical data that's in there. You alluded to several of the places, but examples in scripture where we have it, this kind of thing, where scripture itself calls our attention um, and makes an apologetic for us. Um, I was working. This was this morning. Literally, my emotions had nothing to do with this class, but I, I was in Matthew. And Matthew 1 and 2, I think, is doing a bit of an apologetics uh, for us because it's, it's arguing, of course, you have the genealogy tracing them back to David and Abraham, but then it's, it's going to explain, okay, he, why he was, you know, why he was uh, growing up in Nazareth, but how he could still be from Bethlehem. So it's explaining some things like that, um, certainly explaining the issue of his birth. So you've got some pieces going on there that are very apologetic right there in Matthew. Um, some other things I put down here 
or just interesting, the, the Old Testament Isaiah will mock idols. Um, he will point to God's knowledge of the future. So he'll say, you know, what God is there to predict the future like that? And then he'll, he'll just throw something out there. Okay, how about Cyrus? Um, I'll go ahead and call that one. And he's calling it way out in the future so that when it comes true, okay, you'll look and you'll see. Um, then, well, even I mentioned Isaiah, connect that with Matthew. The virgin birth is prophesied as a sign. So here's a sign for you, and it points all the way up to the virgin birth. Um, pointing to creation as proof for man's awareness. I made all these things. That's an Isaiah thing. Uh, Romans 1 and 2 as well, pointing to uh, creation as a proof for God's, for God. Um, I was intrigued by this Jesus with Thomas. I just had never, but I was, this was from Peller, and just reading through, I was like, well, of course, uh, when Thomas is doubting, and then Jesus answers, okay, reach forth your hands and touch my side and be no longer doubting, but believe. So if Jesus' answer is not to him, just stop um, and repent and then we're done. But Jesus actually does offer him some information. It is actually a sign. Of course, the miracles themselves are a sign. They're called a sign. The apostles and Acts are preaching the resurrection constantly. Uh, Paul at Lystra appeals to God's goodness in the seasons. At Athens, he appeals to God as the creator. There's a bunch of stuff, and I'm just, just kind of standing over a bunch of these things. Yeah, you know, th this kind of touches on the whole debate at, between presuppositional and so-called evidential or classical apologetics. Are we going to get to that later, or is this a good segue? If there's some other things... Can I wait? wait? You might have to wait yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> you don't mind. Am I? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you well. Yeah. It's a. It's a um, little muffled, but it's okay. Okay. Tell me if it's better. Um. Okay. But yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then this take. This does take me a direction I want to go here. Um. And this is the question: Why should we study apologetics? Um. And and the reason I make that segue now is I just. I mentioned a bunch of references there a second ago. I'll mention a couple of more, a couple of others. Um, so these are places where I'm actually seeing not just scripture itself making an apologetic argument, but I'm seeing that in these places, basically we're, we're more or less commanded to do some apologetics or to think that way about it. Um, so here's an example in Acts 18, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating from the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Um, I, I think that's fascinating. So he's pulling from the Old Testament, right? Um, and he's using this apologetically. Titus 1.9 is the pastor must be able to rebuke those who contradict it. So the assumption here is a false teaching that has to be answered. You're not ready to be a pastor unless you can. Uh, meaning, if part of my question is, why should I study apologetics? Certainly, if I plan to be a pastor, this is part of my preparation for the specific things that Paul gives it. These are qualifications for the ministry. Okay? So as a qualification, I have to be able to do this. I'm not ready until I can do this. Um, Titus 1.13, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. That's again, false teaching. So, you know, again, instruction to a pastor is that you're required or you're expected or that God demands that you rebuke people sharply and you have to be able to do that. Titus, or 1 Peter 3.15, this is the one we've already read, but that we have an answer, a defense that's ready to give to anyone who asks for an answer. And then Jude 3, um, I found it necessary writing to, uh, appealing to you to contend for the faith that once once for all delivered to the saints. So again, uh, cases here where I'm, I'm told, explicitly told, ordered as a command to defend the faith or to do something along those lines. Each one of these is in respect to false doctrine. And so we could say well, that doesn't count or something. Um, to which I think the obvious answer is, what is every worldview except a false doctrine of sorts? Right. Um, what is every competitor to Christianity except just a denial? Right. We're talking about the same thing here. So, right. any thoughts there? Any comments? Or, or I'll open up the whole question: Why study apologetics? This is one angle. But anything else you want to add in there? Yeah, I think that what you mentioned there, uh, obviously, a qualification for the pastor to be able to rebuke those who contradict. You, it's not sufficient merely to know the Christian faith well. That that's what. That's what I come away with. You must also understand the objections that other people have to the Christian faith and furthermore, to answer those objections. And I would say that you don't really understand the Christian faith well unless you understand possible objections to it and are able to overcome those objections. Um, because 
if someone, it's one thing for simple, someone to tell you simply, God is both three and one, uh, and just say, okay, great, got it. It's another thing to be able to work through the thorny philosophical problems with it in such a way that you can give a compelling account of that triunity of God's nature, right? Um, so yeah, definitely studying apologetics is, is right for the, for the pastor, but also for, for anybody, um, we have minds and God's ways are far above our ways. And we are commanded to, that our, our faith be, a, it's a thinking faith, right? This is not just an experience we have. This is one thing that contrasts Christianity from many Eastern religions in which it's primarily experiential experientially based whereas no that for us this is something that we are actually to grasp and comprehend with our minds in a way that makes sense so um yeah definitely i would say that one reason to study apologetics on, on a basic level as a believer is because we need to be able to respond to the questions we have in our own minds but then as pastors especially we have to be able to refute those who have arguments against what we believe excellent I have down here um, as one of my reasons for studying apologetics. You should be interested in apologetics because you have a brain and a fallen heart. Those two things, I mean, you have a fallen brain too, right? So we'll talk about the noetic effects of the, of the curse but, uh, or of the fall. But you have a fallen brain and a fallen heart. And so that means that you will personally as a human, you will doubt at some point in your life. And so one reason, it's kind of like a counseling class. Lots of people are interested in counseling classes because <laughs> you come into a counseling class and you think, well, I hope I can help myself out. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, I would say, in, especially in apologetics or in either one, to recognize, what am I? In a counseling class, I'm a sinner that desperately needs help. And so for me to counsel others, I need to start by getting, you know, getting some things figured out for myself. In apologetics as well, I mean, I'm a human with a brain, and I ought to be thinking like that. Another thing I put down here is that you can't not do apologetics. And what I mean by that, it's a question of truth and faith. So even if you say something like, you can't know, and therefore I'm not committing to anything, you just committed to something. Meaning then, whatever you choose then, you have chosen that over other views. Right. And I think there is, um, this is maybe doing a little, is it, am I getting it right, uh, Clifford? Anyway, one of the philosophers yeah. that attaches yeah. an ethical, what's that? That yeah. W.K. Clifford. Ethical. Okay, yeah. An ethical component to truth um, that it's you know the argument is it's immoral to believe something on insufficient evidence um, well I would say something like it's it's unconscionable or anyway it's absurd to not think a little bit at least through why you believe what you believe and so I ought to have a robust faith where I've asked these questions and I've, I've worked through it whatever I view I have then I have that view for some reason and I think I can't not do apologetics in the sense that I can't not have as a human being, at least thought, however um, irresponsibly I might have done it, I can't have not thought through some of the questions and the evidence. What do you think? Yeah, no, that's, that's good. I think that's totally true. Uh, just the fact that you have a brain requires you to do apologetics even to yourself. Um, <laughs> just last night, I was walking home from church and uh, some very uh, troubling doubts were plaguing my mind. Just, you know, sometimes I have these large philosophical thoughts clouding over my brain like is this all real like is this pastoring thing? i mean what's the whole point of this is this is this really true i mean who hasn't had some of those doubts like is this just one big cosmic joke you know right and i thought wait hey i've got my phd in apologetics and worldviews i shouldn't ha be having these thoughts right i I've got a four year very expensive degree to eliminate these doubts that way no no this is the nature of the fall. This is the, like what Joel was, Dr. Arnold was saying. This is the noetic effects of the fall. This is, my, this is my fallen heart. And then as soon as I start thinking through these things, I suddenly realize, hey, nothing else makes sense. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like Peter said, responded when Jesus asked him, oh, well, will you also go away? And, and Peter said, hey, to whom will we go? Uh, I, I had to think, you know, th this is the only way in which reality makes sense. This is the only way in which I can make sense of the fact that I am doubting. <laughs> because there is a God who made my mind and there is a fall that impacted my mind negatively. So what I was doing right there in that short walk between the house, the church and the house was engaging in some personal apologetics. <laughs> uh, you have to do it all the time. It's just the nature of our minds and the word of God and a fallen world we live in. 
I'm going to indulge in some jargon there. I really like what you just did, that like um, the little argument you made about I'm doubting. And not, it's so, I mean, it sounds, it sounds Cartesian. It sounds like Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. Or I doubt, therefore, I am. But it's not. I think it's your abductive concept from your dissertation image of God and the fall. I think it's deeper than Descartes. Anyway, I, I think that's cool. Um, just a little nerd, nerd out there. Um, okay, that's great. I think I will. Um, okay, I have one more down here for uh, why study apologetics, and that is just to witness. So, I mean, and I'm going to broaden this out or fill this idea out a little bit in a second, but it, I'm commanded to witness. I have to witness. Okay, if I'm going to witness, then I have to know how to express what I'm saying, and I should then express it in a good way. Um, my little idea here, you can't not do apologetics. It's a little bit like you can't not have a philosophy or you can't not have a theology or this kind of thing. But then the next line that usually follows that, you can't not have a philosophy, you can't not have a worldview. Everybody has a worldview, some people do it well. Okay, every Christian ought to witness, some people do it well. And part of what we're talking about with apologetics is learning how to witness well. Yeah. Um, which is a concept I wanna explore with you here for just a second. Um, and maybe we'll have to, well, we'll see how it goes with time here. I'm, I'm wanting to think about apologetics in respect to the rest of the disciplines. Um, can I understand apologetics so broadly that basically anytime I'm witnessing, I'm doing some form of apologetics? Can we be that broad or is that too broad? Or how does that strike you? So if I'm witnessing in some kind of way that I'm intentionally communicating to my listener, Let's say that, you know, I'm not just doing a script, like I memorize the script and I recite it, but I'm intentionally communicating to a listener in a way that I hope to address the fallen way they view this world. Is that apologetics or, or anything we want to qualify there? I, yeah, that's a really good question. I think the way you ask that question helps to clarify what apologetics is, kind of going back to the very first question. But say if I were to say to an unbeliever, um, God loves you. Jesus died for you. Believe that he died for you. Repent of your sins. Did I engage in, a, did I share the gospel with him? Yeah, in a very basic form. Did I do apologetics with him? I don't think so. Um, if, if I said something like, um, you know, where did you come from? You know, how can you explain your very existence if you were not created by a God? You know, Furthermore, how can you explain this wretched world were it not for the fact that man has somehow fallen into sin? Okay, now I'm doing apologetics because I'm making an attempt to explain what he already knows in terms of a Christian worldview. Uh, answering, I'm, I'm preempting objections to the Christian faith, but the, the, just the, the naked proclamation of the gospel um, is not necessarily doing apologetics. Otherwise- That's helpful. Otherwise, you don't have any. Um, other, otherwise, you can't even distinguish discourse that answers objections and discourse that just presents um, the, the faith. The faith itself. Now, I think there is a way to present the gospel in such a way that that is compelling. You know, that is a kind of a, apologetic in the sense that. Um, but but then, but then obviously it would be more than just a a naked, straight up presentation of the gospel. You're filling it out because you're speaking to a specific mind. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we have a good parallel here for homiletics or something. Just because you stood up and you talked about the Bible for a few minutes doesn't necessarily mean this comes under the discipline of homiletics. Um, we kind of have an assumption that there's a, at least a minimal level of attention to detail and attention to strategy before we'll call it a sermon and we'll say that it was a homiletical presentation. Um, yeah. And so maybe we set the bar real low, but still something like that. Um, good, fair enough. Um, okay. All the same, though, I think what I think where I end up, and work with me on this, or tell me what you think. I think I end up, though, all the same with a much broader view of apologetics or definition of apologetics than what we normally think of. And what I mean by that, I think, um, if you asked me a couple of years ago or something, what is apologetics? Probably my answer comes out uh, with a lot of arguments about the existence of God. And that's very specific and very narrow, I think, because it is only addressing, one, atheism. 
it's only addressing really the the kind of um, the role of attacking un raw unbelief within a materialistic and um, you know, monistic materialistic secular world. And what you start realizing, I think, is that apologetics becomes as broad as the person you're talking to. That if I'm talking to a person and they're coming to me as a Buddhist, then I'm doing apologetics to address their Buddhism. If they're coming to me and they, they basically have no, they've not thought through what their commitments are, and so it's changing moment to moment, then I'm doing it that way. If they're postmodern, that's what I'm doing. Anyway, whoever I'm addressing, I'm trying to speak the gospel in a way that directly addresses their fallen thinking. Right. And when I'm doing that in a responsible, careful way, a strategic way, an intentional way, that is apologetics. And it's not just in addressing secular materialism. It's not just trying to prove the existence of God. Uh, it's much, much broader than that. It's the whole strategy of how I address unbelief. Yeah, right. am I on the right track That's there? Right. That's totally right. In fact, the way that you described your previous understanding of apologetics was one of the reasons why I didn't even want to choose as my concentration in my for my PhD apologetics and worldviews because I had such a skewed view of apologetics that it was okay let me sit down and prove to you that God exists and I thought well you know pastorally and personally and in every respect that's a waste of time I already believe that I really don't think that many people have serious doubts the number of people in the world that has serious doubts about the existence of God in such a way that it impacts their lives is extremely, extremely small. So who are we even talking to when we're trying to prove the existence of God? Pra virtually, for all practical purposes, nobody. <clears throat> so um, I, that did not interest me at all. Um, but then as I got into the discipline, I realized, whoa, 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 it's, it's way much fuller than that, than that. It's actually taking the entire Christian faith and examining it in its fullness as to how it touches every area of our of our lives as human beings um, in such a way that makes it incredibly compelling so yeah the the, the idea of saying hey let me give you the the five Aquinas is five ways of, of proving God in the cosmological argument the teleological argument the the argument from, from the first mover all that sort of thing um, that that is just a tiny fraction of what apologetics could conceive be conceivably um, yeah what what you said is right you're commending the Christian faith uh, to a person in whatever degree they're doubting. Um, and it's, it is much broader than, than that. Let me ask you a slightly more nerdy form of this. Um, why do you think that's our assumption about apologetics? Like, why do we default to that mentally? Um, a secular, you know, answering sec secular materialism. Why that? Why now? Why do we do it that way? I think it's, I think there's some historical roots to that. Um, is that what you're, is that what you're thinking? Or yeah, you're thinking of, I know, it's basically what I'm asking, yeah. Yeah, right. So, I mean, you have this, um, you, uh, you have like Van Til, uh, who, who comes along and emphasizes the antithesis between a believer and unbeliever, and says that there really is no, a, there is no communication between, there no, there's really no common ground. What the believer has to do is to confront the unbelief of an unbeliever. Otherwise, he is conceding you know, philosophical and theological ground to the unbeliever and trying to fight with him according to his own rules. And so what ends up happening is the whole task of apologetics becomes very narrow. It becomes trying to demonstrate on an intellectual ground why anyone that doesn't believe like doesn't believe in Christianity is absurd in not in not believing uh, the Christian faith. Um, so I, I think there are some, and that led to debates between presuppositionalism and evidentialism. And so we tend to think in terms of those very uh, intellectual type of arguments. Um, so yeah, I think there are some historical roots to the reason why the reasons why we think that way about apologetics. But if we would think, if we would think in a broader way about it, I think, I think there's so much more benefit here. Um, truthfully, let's say this, on a day-to-day -day basis, how much, how often do I encounter a truly like hard-boiled atheist who's just determined not to believe in the existence of any God? S certainly that depends on my context. And so where I'm at here, Philippines, the people that, the average person I'm talking to on any regular basis is basically like a casual something. 
and they're not even sure what they are. They don't, you know, it's just, yeah, I'm Catholic. When I go by the church and there, you know, I see them doing mass, I, I do the sign of the cross or something. It's just kind of a good luck thing. Um, I mean, that's the real people that I'm actually talking to. And I, I can't think of the last time I met a hard-boiled atheist who just said, there's no God, and I'm sure of it, or I have no reason to think there is one. Um, yeah. So that's the, the es- that makes apologetics the essence of irrelevant as far as my daily life, where if we can think about it the way we're talking about it, I have lots of things that I can learn about how to talk to this guy who just doesn't care or has religion as a good luck charm. Um, and apologetics has lots to teach me about how to approach that guy. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I think so. I think another reason possibly for this highly intellectualized, narrowing view of the task of apologetics is that a lot of guys who are writing books on apologetics are interacting, are, are fighting against the secular academy. So, you know, in America, you, you have this idea of, um, you know, in the, in the big universities, the Ivy League schools, um, this secular worldview pervades. And so we feel like, oh, these are the people that we need to answer to. These are the people that we need to, to argue against. Uh, well, that constitutes a very narrow um, uh, range of what overall people are believing. But the books that come down to us then tend to be those that wrestle on that level. But that's not necessarily the level that we're wrestling with every day, even for that matter, within our own selves. Um, I think that is another reason why we encounter um, this this idea on apologetics that's great that's excellent so it's basically it becomes like a um elitization i don't know anyway making it elite um and so then it then since these are the people that lead the way and there's the world that's the world they exist in yeah, yeah interesting well so like even even alvin planting us so his idea that belief in god is properly basic you can believe in god without arguments um it's you're within your epistemic rights to say god believes without even having marshaled a host of evidence or arguments for that. Um, that's a cool idea and I'm all about it. I think that's awesome and I'm glad that he's done that work in that. However, I don't think I'm gonna be ever talking about proper basic belief in God to any person that I'm witnessing to because most people, I mean, you read Romans one, people know there's a God. Um, what planting has done is just uh, constructed a beautiful epistemological case for belief in God without, in the absence of argumentation. That's not relevant to me <laughs> in, in most contexts, um, although I'm glad he did it, and I love that he did it. <laughs> uh, that's, so what he's doing there is negative apologetics. He's, he's been, and we might get to this later, but he's totally clearing the ground for belief in God, pushing against uh, like the Clifford, Cliffordian evidentialism. Um, but, okay, so what does that mean for me? That means that if I happen to meet somebody who says, hey, it's immoral to believe in anything without proper evidence, I've already got a great answer. Now, I'm not gonna meet many people like that. Most people I'm gonna meet are be like, whoa, I thought the Bible was, uh, I thought there's so many manuscripts that we don't know what the Bible says anymore. Is that really true? Oh, no, no, it's not. And let me, let me give you the manuscript evidence for, for the reliability of scripture. It's those sort of things that people are wrestling with. Oh, are the genocides in the Old Testament, really what was going on with that? There's an explanation for that. That's what people are wrestling with. So we unfortunately have left aside many of the more practical and pressing issues um, because these guys that are writing the books are in an ivy, ivory tower in many cases. Not all of them, but some of them are. Great. Keller has a, well, this would illustrate that, right? Keller is actually, he's doing apologetics on the street. Um, and he makes an argument that far fewer people than we think, even in, let's say, the U.S., even in a secular context, very secular context like New York, he argues that fewer, far fewer people than we think are actually walking around as hard-boiled atheists. Most of you are walking around with some kind of like somewhat deist idea of God or like God is removed from our existence or basically, yeah, they believe in a God, but most of the time they're too busy trying to get more stuff to think about it. That's where the, the average person is actually living. Um, and, and, and so addressing apologetics to that person is going to be much more productive because they're, you're going to meet a lot more of them. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me do this before we go out for our break. I'm pulling up a, an image here and this is, we've used this in our biblical theology course. 
Um, and what it is is an attempt to kind of categorize the disciplines. I can't get into all the ins and outs of the way this works. It, I've got it as a nice tidy stack uh, where exegesis yields biblical theology, which yields systematic theology, which yields practical theology, and then historical theology is spread all the way through because in historical theology, we talk about the history of exegesis, history of biblical theology, history of systematic, history of practical theology. In our previous course, we made the point, which is an important one, that it's not so simple. It's not like you have a clear stack. Um, actually, there's a ton of reciprocity. There's the arrows that go in all directions here so that my practical theology leads back to my exegesis and so forth. Okay, but here's the thing. Um, if I'm thinking of apologetics on this chart, I'm looking across the chart and I'm seeing pieces all across the chart that are going to relate to apologetics. So certainly exegesis is going to relate there. Uh, the example I used a little bit earlier of like answering a difficulty was um, that was from a genealogy in Matthew and there's a discrepancy between Matthew and the Genesis genealogy. So that would be an exegetical question for which apologetics would try to yield an answer. Um, biblical theology, we could connect that in the sense that when you are doing apologetics, one of the powerful things you could do is tell the, the big story. And the story of scripture really draws people in, in a way that's very, going to be very effective. You know. uh, systematic theology, there's going to be lots of questions under Trinity and Incarnation that are going to be apologetically uh, controlled and driven. Under historical theology, you could talk about the history of apologetics, which, Lord willing, I plan to do a lecture on in uh, two weeks. But uh, correct me or talk to me about this. I'm putting apologetics under primarily practical theology. And within practical theology, I'm going to connect it in as a related branch close to homiletics. So preaching, how to preach, as well as close to missiology. Um, so paying attention to other worldviews and then how we address them. So a uh, branch of practical theology or part of primarily of practical theology that's related especially to homiletics and missiology. Um, what do you think? Any comments there? Yeah, I think that's good. I would, I would do it in the same way. I was going to say, hey, wherever you put apologetics depends on what you mean by apologetics, but mostly we are, we're understanding apologetics as the task, something that we do, right? So, um, yeah, I would put it in practical theology, and I like the way that you link it to missiology and homiletics, because it's kind of the same thing. It has to do with our presentation of those things that are lying below it. And you're right, there are some apologetic aspects of the scriptural text, which is why you see some intermingling in the, with its exegesis. And I love the way you put it about biblical theology. Yeah, the meta narrative of scripture is a compelling explanation of who we are now, wh why we are the way we are. Uh, I think biblical theology. If you, if you allow yourself to feel the force and enter into the worldview of Scripture, man, that's, that in itself is amazingly, uh, has amazing apologetic value. But it's not apologetics in itself. So I, I think, strictly speaking, apologetics definitely belongs to practical theology. Great. Okay. Um, let's do this. Let's take a break. So I've got 9.06, or what we end up doing is just, say, six minutes after the hour. Uh, I've got six minutes after the hour. Let's come back at 11 minutes after the hour. Let's pick up here. We've got a lot of other topics that we can cover, and we'll see how we do. Uh, but let's be back sharp uh, nine or 11 minutes after the hour. We'll talk to you then. Thank you. Good. Yeah. I read several books, too. <laughs> no doubt. Um, okay. I'll do this as a flyby question, and we'll just uh, see. So you want to name a couple of contemporary theologians? Um, or like some big names and maybe some people that you have enjoyed, admired, appreciated, benefited from, and then you could also do some past theologians that you've liked. Oh yeah. Um, boy, that's a, that's a big question. Okay. So you've mentioned Tim Keller yep. um, and he would be, uh, I think very effective on a popular level of what he's done, I think is really good. Um, I, of course, that's not a, an endorsement of everything he's done just just as you know but he's uh i think excellent um you know i've benefited from some of the stuff that john frame has put out um i i really like uh kj van hooser um some of his stuff he, he's uh he's written some really excellent articles um a book that i find very helpful is 
the new dictionary of biblical apologetics. I've talked with Dr. Arnold about it before, and it has some just helpful introductory um, introductory type articles in it. If you have a chance to get that book, I, I really recommend it. It'd be a good resource as, as a pastor, as you look at different, I'm, I have it in front of me right now. So if you, uh, you know, any, any kind of issue that you're struggling with from an apologetic perspective, um, as far as, um, you know, those are some guys, Doug, Doug Grow Twice, that's G-R-O-O-T-H-U-I-S, Doug, uh, it's pronounced, uh, some people say grew, grew twice. I've heard it grow twice. Um, he's another one that I, I think is an excellent. He's written a book on apologetics, a pretty lengthy book. Um, he was my outside reader for my dissertation. And uh, so, because he's done some work on Blaise Pascal. So I, I'd recommend his, I've learned a lot from him as well. Um, as far as... Um, past apologists um man of course the the one for my, that i focused on for my dissertation was was blaze pascal and uh the reason why i like him is because uh he focuses on uh he's, he's not when you when you get before the 1800s when it comes to apologetics you, you're, you're reading guys that are actually doing apologetics instead of arguing about apologetics so i like that and uh, one reason why I like about one thing that I like about Pascal is that I found him very personally convincing. Um, when he's talking about the wretchedness of the human condition, I almost felt like he was tearing open my own heart and looking inside. And I felt embarrassed that someone knew me so well. <laughs> you know, I like guys that do that to me. Um, I already mentioned uh, Alvin Plantinga. I like him, and he's a contemporary guy, although he's. I don't know how old he is now. He must be in his 80s, but he's written a ton. He's not the easiest reading, but what he's done in academia to, um, I guess, infuse courage into Christian philosophers to be who they are as Christians and not to be apologetic about their own beliefs is amazing. He has, he has really led the charge in turning the tide in some, um, some academic circles to bolster the credibility of Christianity because of his work in epistemology. So I'd really recommend if, if you're ready to tackle some of the more philosophical literature, uh, his book on warrant and, and um, warranted Christian belief is, is good. Um, I just, let's... can I insert in here real quick? I, I mean, they were giving excerpts, it was only excerpts, and this was in Boa and Bowman. Yeah. Um, but there were just enough excerpts from him. And it, it was, it was delightful. Here's a guy who is teaching, like all or it's not like he's teaching in a Christian university. I mean, he's, he, in his context, he's surrounded by people that would completely deny the existence of a God or so, and very aggressively so. Um, and he's just saying, hey, you know, as Christians, we don't have to cower. Like this is completely, it's, it's rational, it's reasonable even if you want to look historically, like human beings across human history, um, very intelligent people. So just because in our day, then there's you know, a kind of a consensus among people that in, in academia that would view religion as so last year doesn't mean that we need to cower in fear. It was very refreshing, very bold, um, kind of to use a Jordan Peterson idea, you know, stand up straight with your shoulders back. I mean, okay, why are you scared? Just because your context mocks you for what you believe, this is not this is not a foolish belief. So yeah, anyway, I found that very refreshing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Those are guys that come come to my mind right away. I think you mentioned Bo and Bowman. I think if you read that book, it will familiarize you with all the major guys with with the the major ones, and that'll give you a good sense as to who is who's out there. Um, uh, and what they're doing. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, I mean, other, I had a couple of, I, I'll just like, read a list of names I'd put down. R.C. Sproul, Geisler, John Frame, I've enjoyed a good bit. These are uh, popular level guys, so they've done some interesting work. James White, um, if we're doing like the creationism thing, then you can do two polls. Um, so, you know, we hear of a AIG and Kim Ham and Young Earth Creationism, Hugh Ross on the other side of things, and Old Earth Creationism, Gary Habermas, 
William Lane Craig, um, a couple of other big names that, that rattle around, and I'm skipping a bunch. Um, no, another, I... what's that? Go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned uh, Pascal, and this was again from Bowen Bowman. If somebody wants to pick up Bowen Bowman, it's a great book. Uh, maybe I'll try to put the link in here in chat in just a second. But um, again, I, and I did this when I read uh, aspects or parts of your dissertation, um, and then reading him again and just getting quotes and a summary from Pascal. That guy, it's, it is, it just cuts to the straight, the, the core of your humanity. It's like reading a modern Solomon in Ecclesiastes. It's just, it's awesome. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, I, I can, I, can I just comment on a couple of these guys here? With, yeah, go. Uh, William Lane Craig, uh, he has written his book. I think it's called Reasonable Faith. Uh, let me just see here. Um, yeah, Reasonable Faith. It, it, that is a, an excellent book. It's a, it would be a great introduction. If you don't have a book specifically on apologetics, that would be a good introduction um, for you. Uh, he writes very clearly, it's, uh, but it gives some good resources for you to have. Um, he, he, recently, though, I've, I've been a little disappointed. He, he defended Andy Stanley in Andy Stanley's, um, uh, you know, Andy Stanley has been kind of unhitching himself from the Bible. <laughs> you know, he tried to unhitch the Old and New Testaments, and now he's been making some. But, and, and Lane Craig, for whatever reason, decided to, to stand up for him and, and defend him on that, which, I, which I'm just disappointed by. Um, but his, his book, Reasonable Faith, is a great introduction to apologetics as a discipline and a lot of practical aspects in there, too. Um, Can I see a little flag in that comment? Um, let's come back to this. That trajectory or that tendency within apologetics to let your apologetics start pulling you away little by little from your, your core commitments to Christianity and to careful exegesis. Okay, little flag. Come back to that theme later. Okay, okay well, Um. So Geisler, you know, he, um, he's good. I definitely would, would use him. He's very, he's an Aristotelian. Like he's, ex, he's, ex, he's been extremely influenced by Aristotle. Uh, interestingly to, you know, through, through Thomas Aquinas too. So, um, I, there, there are things, he, he seems a little narrow to me in terms of his understanding of the apologetic task. Um, frame would be broader. I, I, I like frame, um, except for I can't help but stop thinking in threes as soon as I read frame. Everything, everything's a trinity. Um, so, yeah, the other guys you mentioned, they, they're, they're all good resources. Geisler, a, a very incredibly accomplished and um, so forth. Uh, intellectually, he can annoy me a little bit. Um, it, it's 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 so it's so like yeah, anyway. It's Aquinas. It's all just like all laid out in this nice framework, and it, it can be annoying. Someone put on here Ravi Zachari, uh, Ravi Zachari, but I say that I mean he's obviously incredibly Geisler is incredibly accomplished, and so I, there's some great books that I've really enjoyed from him. Um, Ravi Zacharias, yes, uh, on a popular level, and we didn't mention mention C.S. Lewis, who's arguably the most influential apologist apologist of the 20th century, which is interesting. Um, if I'm thinking of, let's say, him and Tim Keller, there's something here for both of them. Um, you know, Keller ends up getting compared sometimes to Lewis. But somebody made a comment, I don't remember what book it was, somebody made a comment that Lewis illustrates the power of style or the power of communicative, communicative skill for apology, uh, for apologetics. And I think Keller is there too. The guy just knows how to communicate an idea really, really well. In Lewis's case, there's some significant like theological limitations or some some issues, but he got a lot done. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Comments, comments there or thoughts? Um, this, uh, yeah, you can't. We can't help but segue into this whole idea of how much letting apologetics overtake your theology. So, are are we going to go there? <laughs> go ahead. Let's do it. This is the time. This is the place. Let's go. Yeah. So, okay, with when you read C.S. Lewis, you know, he, in his book, Mere Christianity, he gets to give this metaphor of a hallway off of which are different rooms in the house. And he's trying to get people into the hall. 
And he says, but where you need to be is in the rooms. And the rooms, he says, are the various denominations. So you, that's, where your, that's where your liturgy takes place. That's where your worship happens. That's where your faith is lived out in the rooms. He's trying to con- persuade you to mere Christianity, which is just the, the essence of what Christianity is. But the question is, what is mere Christianity? Like, can we agree on the bare minimum of the Christian faith such that that gets somebody into the door of one of those rooms? And I think that's where, in a sense, I wonder, does Lewis's apologetics overtake his theology? Is he, is he saying, hey, as he does in one of the chapters of his book, he says, hey, it doesn't matter which theory of the atonement you adopt, as long as you adopt an, a, a theory of the atonement, whether it's, and he lists different possibilities. And then he tries to give a bare minimum of what that, the meaning of the atonement is. Well, the question is, is it necessary to believe in a vicarious substitutionary atonement? <laughs> I think it is. I think that's what scripture teaches. But uh, he would say, no, as, as long as you believe that Jesus did something on your behalf that you couldn't do for yourself, um, that, that would be sufficient. And then you can choose specifically how to articulate that theory in your particular room uh, of, that, of that house of faith. Um, so what's going on here is they're trying to define Christianity as broadly as possible to make the task of apologetics as easy as possible <laughs> uh, to convince as many people as possible, as opposed to say, saying, hey, let's just confront you with the, the hard truths of Christianity. Here it is. And that's all, all its complexity and wonder and all its, the way it defies our comprehension. This is what God has said. Now, if you can move anybody, any degree toward that, even if it means, okay, are you, as an apologist, are you trying to convince someone on the street to believe in vicarious substitution or atonement with those words, with those concepts? Like, that's probably not going to be your first step, right? Uh, what you're trying to do is move them any closer than they are now. And I think if you have done that, then you've been successful in apologetics. Um, but the question is, what exactly are you defending? Is it the fullness of the Christian faith? Or is, the, is this kind of whittled down uh, Christianity that doesn't really require much confrontation to submit to? Um, the temptation is to think, you know, maybe I can start uh, even like, Actually, some forms of classical apologetics do this as a stated process. But, you know, the idea is like, well, let's start and we'll just get the existence of God. And then once we can build the existence of God, then we can convince them, carry them into like, you know, scripture. And then from there we can go into Christology and such like that. Um, So the temptation is it seems easier to do that. But if I'm dropping out Jesus or I'm dropping out some kind of, there's some kind of core, like some core that is, saving and if i have to drop pieces of that off to get them in the door to get started i I don't know that it's any more effective because i dropped off jesus um seems like there's a core that i have to bring in together what do you think yeah well okay if you can think about it this way suppose you're talking to a complete as you would put it dr arnold a hard-boiled atheist they don't even believe that god exists now suppose you want them to trust in christ would it not be reasonable to first of all say, hey, I have at least got this, I, I have to at least get this guy to believe that there is a God before I could get him to believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It would make sense to say, I've been successful in my apologetic efforts if I convince him that God exists. And then tomorrow at breakfast, we can talk about <laughs> God, God's son and God loving the world and everything. So um, it's, I, I think that we have to, understand apologetics in terms of what that person needs to move them toward faith in Christ. But what you give them is something that can satisfy them or your apologetic efforts that doesn't end with faith in Christ. I think that's sufficient, uh, insufficient. You know, that's, that's not appropriate. So if you say, Hey, now, you know, he's a theist. That's great. You know, I convinced him that God exists. No, 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 no. You, You didn't finish. You're not done. Um, that, that may be a necessary step. And that's one thing that I, I think that the presuppositionalists are onto in that they say, or, and I even like, I'll, I'll go to Blaise Pascal because I'm, I'm so familiar with him. He, he would, and, and Dr. Arnold, you mentioned Descartes earlier. So one of Descartes' projects was to actually convince people in the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. So he, he's saying, we gotta convince people that God exists and that our souls will live somewhere forever. 
and how are we going to do this? Well, he had this amazing rational argument for the existence of God based on the cogito, cogito ergo. Uh, and, and then he moved on to prove the immortality of the soul. Um, but Pascal, who was a contemporary, said, how ridiculous is it to prove in the existence of God that you, you think can be known apart from Christ? If the God that you came to know is a God that can be approached apart from Christ and the cross, then that is a not, not a God before whom you must be humbled, but it's a God that actually you've arrived to by the power of your own intellect. Therefore, that's not the God of the Bible, right? So what he would argue is that knowledge and understanding of God must come through Christ, else whatever God you believed in is not true, truly God. And how do you know that? Well, you know that if your response to having belie- arrived at the understanding of God results in, in pride and self-sufficiency rather than complete, utter desperation and humility and joy at the same time. So I like what he's doing there. He's bringing together the, the uh, it's a Christocentric approach to apologetics, in which, yeah, you, you, can, you can give arguments for the, the existence of God, no problem. It's not that he was against those, but that's insufficient in itself. You said to me in a previous conversation, any apologetic approach that considers the job done without confronting someone with the person of Jesus is a broken approach. We aren't just trying to convince people to go with a Christian worldview. I mean, fundamentally, we're, we're taking them all the way to Jesus died for you. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, but, but then I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that any other argument is, is inappropriate. Like some people say, no, 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 you can't even argue for the evidence of the resurrection or the, the reliability of scripture or the, the, you know, a compelling case for the Trinity unless the person first repents of their sins and believes in Jesus. No, I, I'm not, there, there may be various things that people need to bring them to Christ. Um, and whatever we can do to do to make that happen, I think is good and should be done. Um, okay, let's do that. Let's go there. Um, cause we haven't really introduced, and this, I, I think, uh, we'd be on the same, we would be on the same page here. Um, so it's tempting to say an apologetics course, we're going to have an apologetics discussion. Great. Are you evidentialist or presuppositionalist? Um, like there are two categories of apologetics, which one do we fall in? Um, can you explain to us, first of all, those, like the proposed two categories, or anyway, just give us a little introduction into the debate, or um, carving up, the temptation to carve up apologetics into those two camps, and then give us your viewpoint on, yeah, just how you would view that, that discussion. Um, yeah, well, I'll give, I, I think the evidentialism, evidentialism as an approach to apologetics and presuppositionalism as a, an approach to apologetics, it, it really is a matter of what you are going about to do in apologetics, like your, your whole approach. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the presuppositionalist would say, unless you presuppose Christianity, there can be no reasonable discourse. So even having an argument with somebody about the truth claims of Christ must presuppose a God who reveals himself, who is reasonable, who made our minds able to think. And so the very, I mean, you're arguing with an unbeliever and you're saying the very fact that we're having this discussion presupposes the truth of what I'm trying to prove, prove to you. So why should I try to prove to you something that is the very groundwork of our discussion? So what, I, what I'm trying to do as a presuppositionalist is demonstrate that it's absurd of him to presuppose anything else than, than Christianity, right? Um, and, and then you can go as far as Bonson and say, if you do anything else, if you present evidences for Christianity apart from requiring that your interlocutor presuppose the truth of of Christianity, then you are actually undermining the authority of the word of God. Okay, so that would be the presuppositionalist stance. They say, you, you've got to presuppose. And I agree with that in the sense that, yes, of course we have to presuppose the, the truths of Christianity. Of course, rational discourse is impossible unless there was, a, unless there is a God who is a reasonable God who gives us minds to understand. Obviously, yeah. Um, well, what does that mean for the task, task of apologetics? Does that mean I'm not allowed to do anything else but but insist that my, the person to whom I'm talking accept those same presuppositions. 
Um, I, I think that that's where a, presupposition, a presuppositionalist makes a mistake in, in, in saying, hey, you can't, it's, it's um, undermining the authority of God's word if you do anything else. And, and he, would, he would just cast aspersions upon C.S. Lewis for his old apologetic argument. I'm like, I'm not willing to do that because I think that whatever, they're, whatever that, that can happen to br bring that person to faith in Christ is a good thing. Um, the evidentialist, on the other hand, would uh, say, hey, no, we really need to present arguments and evidences for the truth of Christianity. Let's talk about the resurrection. Let's talk about the eyewitness report. Let's talk about the fulfilled prophecies. Um, let's talk about miracles and how they um, bolster the claims of Christ. And, and this will help people believe. But again, I think that depends on what people's objections are. It could be that someone isn't convinced by the resurrection. It could be so, that someone is, they're like, okay, resurrection, whatever. But why would a good God send people to hell? Like that really bothers them. Well, you have to deal with that. Um, so again, it's just, it depends on who you're talking to. Um, that, that's where I would try to just back up from the whole debate and say, it's not a matter of being an evidentialist or a presuppositionalist. It's a matter of who you're talking to. It's a matter of their, their objections and what they need to understand uh, what Christianity is all about and why it is reasonable and compelling to believe it. That's great. And just to give a, we'll, we will learn more about presuppositionalism um, as the course goes on in future lectures and so forth. Um, so even the reading I gave you from John Frame, he is like a more a more nuanced presuppositionalist. He would wear the presuppositionalist label, label but he does good work and he uses he uses good evidences and supports and so on and so forth. So he's not as I'll use the hard boiled thing. He's not as uh, hard boiled as a strong uh, a presuppositionalist in that sense as like Greg Bonson was. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean just to divide all the apologetics into two camps. Um, and in some of the like the Bonson expressions of presuppositionalism, you are either doing true believing apologetics, which means <laughs> the way he did it, or you're not. And those are the only two choices. Um, it, it can turn a little narrow or a little frustrating. Yeah. So if somebody, and here's the thing that I would, I would be annoyed with when people, I would talk to people about my studies at Southern Seminary. I would tell them I'm studying apologetics. And the next question they would ask is, oh, are you a presuppositionalist or an evidentialist? I'm like, I was like confused about that. I was like, I, I didn't know what that was at first. I was like, you know, this is really embarrassing. And then, and then I realized, oh, what, what's going on here is that people have, have read books that divide everything into those two camps. And so what, what I realized is if, if you ask me, am I a presuppositionalist? And does that mean that I believe that to have any rational discourse, you must presuppose the truth of God's word? Yes, I'm a presuppositionalist. Does that mean that I am unwilling to, to make any other arguments that supposedly undermine the authority of word of God from Bonds' perspective? Of course not. Like, is it, in, in terms of how I do apologetics, I would be very much an evidentialist, I suppose, because I'm willing to present evidence and reasons for the for belief in Christ. Now, if you ask me, are you an evidentialist in the sense that you think that we must concede philosophical uh, ground to the unbeliever? No, of course not, right? I, I operate from my presuppositions. Um, so when you ask that question, are you a presuppositionalist or an evidentialist? It just depends on whether that means you're going to do apologetics, exactly how you do apologetics. And I would, I would contend it depends on who I'm talking to. It depends on what their particular needs are. I really liked at the end of Boa and Bowman, the last chapter, or it's in the conclusion anyway, they did this comparison to the body of Christ where you, you have lots of different people with lots of different gifts. Um, and they did a comparison with that to um, apologetics approaches so that you might find yourself talking to somebody and you might need to approach from a certain, using a certain vantage point and depending on the person you're talking to. Um, so therefore, I, it would seem to me the implication of it is the apologist that is most prepared is a person who actually has the capability to function in multiple different ways. Um, a person who can transform, and a person who can move into this other mode um, when they're recognizing a need here. Um, does that sound right to you, or what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, it, it, it kind of. Um, oh, I'll, I'll try to give you an example. In fact, somebody just said, "What about Chronicles of Narnia?" So, uh, what's going on in Chronicles of Narnia? It, it's it's not a rational argument for Christianity. It's more like Lewis has painted a picture. And invited you to experience that that narrative, 
And that narrative resonates deeply with the Christian narrative because there's this creator and there's this moral war and there's, there's moral responsibility and all that. So if you can, if there's someone that's a more aesthetically minded person, like their inclination is toward aesthetics and beauty and all that sort of thing, they may find their hearts won over by the beauty of a worldview that is, is also true, okay? Or you may have a person who's non-aesthetic. They're more like a logical sort of minded person. They need arguments. They need a, they need a syllogism. They, they need a, a proposition, proposition, uh, and then a conclusion uh, that ties all that together. I was talking with somebody uh, a couple years ago, and I asked him, how would you try to convince someone who doesn't believe in a particular truth? How do you convince them of that? And he said, oh, you know, instead of giving them an argument, I paint a beautiful picture and invite them into that. And I thought, oh, you know, how, um, just how touchy-feely. It just, it just kind of, there, there was something that I, thought, I felt a little weird about that. But in, in a sense, I think we have to be able to do, we have to be able to do it all. Like we have, depending on who we're talking to, um, we have to be able to say, hey, doesn't it, uh, doesn't it make so much more sense to believe uh, that the reason why we feel so unhappy is because we were created for, for ultimate happiness and we've fallen from that? And, and doesn't, the, doesn't the story of the Bible that teaches how God created human beings and, and made them his vice regents and, 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 and committed, commissioned them to infuse into the world his good character? I mean, but we've fallen from that. Doesn't, doesn't that just resonate with your experience? So again, it, it's like, if you're talking to a more aesthetically inclined person, you might paint a picture. If you're talking to a more rationally minded person, you may give arguments. If you're talking to a, a person who needs a, a moral argument, they may say, isn't, isn't the community of Christians, look at this, look at this local church, how they love each other. I mean, doesn't that demonstrate the truth of Christianity? Um, so there's a lot of different angles you could come at. Your, you know, paint a picture and invite them into it sound, sounds like soft in the head or something. But the thing that, that pops in my mind here, I remember at one point, I'm preaching. Um, there was a person there that I knew as an unbeliever. And I, I, if that's part of my sermon, I'm reading that, that passage at the end of Revelation 20 and 21. God will wipe all tears from their eyes. I'm just reading that in bad tagalo. Um, and I look down and this person is crying on the front row, like really crying. And I, I think that represents something because the heart of every human just, it just, it just comes to life in that passage. Like this is the deepest longings of us. Yeah, the world is broken and it, it's going to get fixed. Um, so, I mean, that's it, right? I think scripture is doing that. It's, it's painting for you. God will make sense of this messed up world and you can't not respond to that. It's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. You said to me previously, and I wrote it down, um, apologetics is not done in a vacuum. We're talking to people, not machines. And so sometimes this goes back to our idea of apologetics being broader than just, you know, here are my, here are my five um, classical proofs. So someone might be using arguments with me, and, and actually the arguments are a smoke screen for deeper hurt that they, under, they, they experience in life. And if you can get through that hurt or you can get through the arguments, you might actually get down to the hurt and deal with that. If you can deal with the hurt, the arguments just evaporate because that's really where it's at is, is there something on an emotional level we're talking about. So, I mean, it's a good reminder when we're, when we're witnessing or let's put it in an apologetics context, when we're talking to somebody, you're dealing with a whole human. And that includes even you know, emotional experiences or challenges like that that are under not just they're not just a brain um yeah so. yeah Th that's good i think um whenever we talk to people i think whenever we preach whenever we witness whenever we counsel we have to remember what kind of thing we're talking to <laughs> we're talking to somebody with a mind and a heart we're talking to somebody whose mind and heart are so integrated that you can't untangle them that the reasons people they people give for not believing in Christianity, if their logic arguments are deeply entangled with, yeah, hurt, pain, misunderstanding, rejection. And that's why I think it's so important in, in talking with people, and I'm talking about doing practical one-on-one -on -one or group apologetics, is that you ask questions. Like when I, there are times when I've gone door to door and, and people say, hey, no, I don't believe in God. I'm, I've actually, I've met people who claim to be atheists. And the first question I have for them is, the first thing response I make is not, well, let me tell you why God actually exists. I want to know how they became an atheist. 
because I understand that atheism is something that you don't arrive at. You're not born with atheism. <laughs> You're born with theism. You come to atheism because of something that happened to you. I want to know what happened to them. I want to know who talked with them. I, know, I want to know what they went through because that's the thing to tackle. I talked to another guy one time who said that he would never go to a church or believe in God because there was a particular church in that city that was absolutely repulsively um, lavish in their building. He said he would drive by that building, this massive cathedral of glass and steel, and, th and think, how in the world could anybody spend that sort of money when there are people in this city that are hungry? Well, I should I believe in a Christianity that would compel people to waste money like that. Okay, there is a really important apologetic opportunity for me to explain to him why it's good to big, build expensive buildings. No, I'm just kidding, that's not what I said. But uh, anyway, so there, there was, you know, there was his objection. And so, and that came about as, you know, asking questions. So I, you have to understand where people are at to know what to tell them. That's great. Let me take us another layer into the kind of the presuppositionalism thing because we will talk about it further in this class as we go ahead. Um, so, and I want to, I'll just give a kind of a, I'll give an attempt at a representative presuppositionalist argument, which is, it's great. But okay, two guys sit down, down at a table and uh, an unbeliever says, I can't believe in God because there's evil in the world. How can there be a good God who is all powerful and there's still evil? And the presuppositionalist answer runs something like, well, you have apparently some idea of good existing as a thing. So without a God, we don't have good and we don't have evil. Like you and I are just collections of atoms. And so what is good, whether, you know, someone walks in and shoots us both dead right here in cold blood, whatever, some atoms changed in form, but you know, it doesn't matter unless there's a God. So the fact that you even have an idea of a God or an idea of good and evil is because you're presuming some sense of the existence of God. Now it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good argument. It's great. And it, it kind of feels a little bit like you're doing um, philosophical jujitsu on somebody or something. It's kind of like you're taking an idea, twisting it all around, like, whoa, whoa, how did I end up here? That's weird. Um, it leaves you in a little bit of a question. It's hard for me to imagine the guy going, you know what? You're right. It's time for me to get saved, um, which is unfair because obviously we would hope the presuppositionalist pre goes on to build a fuller case. Um, the other side of it is that the uh, an, a more an evidentialist case would run something like, okay, well, let me talk to you about the history of the texts. Uh, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do like a, a, well, I'll do like a resurrection type of evidentialism. But let's talk about the history of the text. We have a ton of texts. The New Testament is one of the best supported documents that we have. And if you go into those documents, we can feel, we can, if we can't believe the New Testament documents, you just look at the statistical numbers and on this, if we can't believe these documents, we basically don't know anything from ancient literature. I mean, because the numbers are just crazy, tilted towards the New Testament. And if we go into the New Testament documents, look at all of this information, all of these reasons, the disciples could not have just made up a resurrection and just lied about it because they're within a generation of it. So other people would have known about this. People would have called them on it. They put these documents out there and they, they did it with thousands of witnesses in some cases, 1 Corinthians 15, people that could come around and say, yes or no, this actually happened. I mean, you just couldn't get away with a scam like this. It's too big of a scam to pull it off. You just can't pull it off. Okay, um, between those two sides, I think the presuppositionalist, I think I'm being fair, looks back and says to this guy, I have some issues with how you did that um, because you basically assumed a secular and a quote scientific materialist way of doing uh, epistemology, establishing truth. And so you gave up some ground in order to even have the discussion. And so I don't want to start out assuming an atheist kind of like, well, we'll just all start on a you know, Let's do science. We'll do it as science, the scientific case for Christianity. We don't want to do science as though Jesus doesn't exist, right? We want to do science in the context of Jesus. Um, am I presenting the two sides effectively, or am I presenting the, the two perspectives? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that would be a good sketch of how that conversation might go. And, and I would probably respond to the presuppositionalists and say, hey, is not my Christianity robust enough to say, okay, you want to play by these rules? We can still win. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not conceding anything that we have. We've 
that there is a secular materialistic worldview. I'm just saying, hey, when it comes to evidence, we've got that too. Uh, can I add a third conversational par partner? Good. <laughs> uh, so another. So the question that you raised, that the objector has is, what was the problem of evil, right? How can an omnibenevolent, omnipotent um, yeah. God uh, allow such evil? So I, I would, I could come in and, and the evidentialist has said his thing and the presuppositionalist said a, a thing. And now I say, hey, I, I talk to this objector. And I say, hey, listen, imagine that there was a, a God who created a world and he created it for his own glory. And yet, yet the, the very humans that he invested so much in, they, they rebelled against him and, and it brought all this evil into the world. And then finally he sends his own son who takes on himself all that evil and suffers. You know, so I'm not addressing the question directly, but what I'm is I'm giving the narrative of scripture and then focusing on the cross without addressing the, without trying to grapple with the philosophical issues. I'm grappling with the undergirding emotional and, and moral issue of the, of the son of God taking with himself an evil he did not deserve to, to suffer. And therein lies the, the solution to the problem of evil because, because of what Jesus did one day God will wipe away all tears for those who believe in him. Uh, so th there are different ways to do that. What I did is I took a more C.S. Lewis um, aesthetic approach that I, I, can, I could bolster with arguments. I could say, hey, I, you know, in fact, what an approach I might take is this. I would probably give the philosophical arguments first on an intellectual level and say, and now if that doesn't make sense to you, let me, let me see if this draws your heart in. <laughs> because... At some point with that story of the gospel, recognizing that there is only one being in this entire universe that suffered unfairly, and he suffered for you. Okay, I didn't answer any philosophical questions, but I answered the question of the heart, you know, and I answered and I dealt with the solution of the problem. So it's not that one is better than another. It's that we need a cumulative case um, to, to pile up on that person. Um, so. That's great. A big question that comes in here is, do we have common ground with unbelievers? And uh, the presuppositionalist side is going to go really strong to say um, the noetic effects of the fall, which means the mind-breaking effects of the fall, because a person has fallen, they're not even thinking straight. Um, and so I, as a believer, can't really even have like a conversation like, okay, let's engage. You know, we sh okay, we share the same standards of truth here. So since we say share the same standards of truth and logic and ethics, then let's measure those standards and we'll and, and we'll weigh everything out and out will pop out the truth for God. Um, they've got a there's there's a point to be made there that I don't share the same I don't share the same common ground with an unbeliever on a lot of these things. But here's what I'm wondering, and I'm going to see how you respond to this. I, the way I've tended to be processing this recently is to think, yeah, so man is blind. Uh, unregenerate man is, is deeply blind. But can I say, um, under the, the whole category of the image of God and the reality of the way that God made our minds, even given sin and given the brokenness, there is still an area that we're actually looking at the same world and we are looking at the same things that are coming up. Yeah, there, there is a kind of a common ground that the image of God ends up forming for us. Is that a legitimate category to put this into? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that you have to assume if there was no common ground, then it's no point talking to anybody until they get saved. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be ultimately what you'd have to say. Um, yeah. Because then you'd have to, yeah. So I, I think, and along, I'll just, if I could direct you to, um, I, I mentioned Doug Groh twice. So he has an article in the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology, uh, and the article is called Points of Contact. And he lists several points of contact. So he, he would not be a presuppositionalist in the, in the definition, in the bon, Bonsenian presuppositionalist, because he believes, hey, uh, he talks about, okay, the logos of God. Um, he talks about truth. People have, people have a grasp of what truth is. Like, like, you know, logicians know that there are some abiding truths. And Augustine makes a really powerful argument that the very existence of truth uh, points to a personal God. Um, so, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, yeah, we're created in the image of God. That image is perverted in a way that causes it to um, self-destruct. <laughs> we have self-destructive tendencies. But, yeah, we, we have points of contact. I think, though, what, 
we should keep in mind is that the point at which someone actually believes in Christ, which is the whole goal of apologetics, right? We want, and, and witnessing, we want them to put their faith in Christ is something absolutely supernatural. Like there is something that cannot be, a person cannot be compelled into by reasons, by a beautiful story into which they're invited. It's not just that you're, you're trying to get people to adopt a particular worldview or to say, oh, okay, I see it now. Yeah, it's that you're trying to get someone to do something that conf absolutely conflicts with their very nature. So it's, it's, con it's contrary to our very nature to see ourselves as sinners. It's contrary to very nature to, I'm not saying, you know, most people will admit, okay, I'm a sinner, I, I mess up. But what's contrary to nature is to see ourselves as so bad that we deserve an everlasting punishment. Like that's revolting. That's revolting. Um, it's contrary to nature to see our sin so bad that the son of God actually had to die for it. it in, order, in, in order for a person to acknowledge that with complete faith and confidence and look at Christ as the only savior requires the, the Holy Spirit to work in that person's life. So all these things are just, it's almost like we're taking a machete and we're uh, slashing down the, the undergrowth of the noetic effects of the fall so that that person, so that the Holy Spirit can push that person along. Um, the tipping point is a supernatural thing. And I think that's why you, you read in, is it second Corinthians where Paul says that, uh, you know, actually I better turn there because it's in first, it's in first Corinthians. Yeah. So in first Corinthians, it talks about um, the Holy spirit who gives this. Okay. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God because they're folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Like there's a point in which, God's spirit has to step in <laughs> to convert that person. And I think any apologetic approach has to have the humility to recognize that. Yeah, nice. Uh, there's a couple of pieces that goes on a couple of different strands for me at the same time. Um, so one of them was the idea where we talked earlier about apologetics, like a pusillanimous apologetic, like a weak apologetics. Please believe my worldview. Um, I like the idea of thinking of apologetics not as my trying to take Christianity, reconfigure it so it'll sound good to you, but actually trying to, to take my, my, my worldview, what I believe, what do you know from scripture, and in some cases I am clearing out things they thought wrongly, like they always thought that the New Testament documents were just patched together in the last couple of hundred years or something, and so I'm showing them like, no, that's actually not true, like there, it's a lot more robust than you think. Okay, so I'm clearing that away. But in uh, some other points, I'm just going to step forward and end up saying some things to them like, hey, this is what it is. I mean, a little bit of it is going to be kind of really direct. When it comes right down to it, I'm not going to step back on sin and be like, well, you know, uh, you know, God doesn't take it that seriously or everybody has mistakes or something. It's like you're really going to step forward and say, like, no, God is holy and sin is serious and this is not a thing you mess around about. Um, and so there's times when I am kind of clearing something out of the way, and there's other times when it's just, it's going to be really direct. And apologetics would call me to do both, sometimes to clear something away and sometimes to say it even stronger than they might have been expecting me to say it. Um, anything you want to add there or build on that? Yeah, I, well, hey, what I, what I think there is, like, is suppose uh, someone were trying to, um, suppose you, you were overhearing two people talking, and one of them was a friend and one of them was an enemy. And the friend was trying to uh, defend you to the enemy, right? So to somebody who's trying to criticize you, um, you would want to make sure that what that friend expresses is actually your true character. So when it comes to, when it comes to God, God is listening to our apologetic approaches. <laughs> we, we don't want to present a God that's somehow watered down or weaker than what he really is. I mean, God is a fierce God. He is a, he is a terrible God. Um, he, he's a loving God. He, he's, he's ferocious in his wrath, but he's passionate in his love. And we've got, I think the, the, the more we can present God in his fullness, the more powerful our, product, our apologetic will be. If we try to give a one-sided view of God and the Christian faith, then, then the person, it's not really God that we're convincing them to, but an idol. <laughs> so we, we've got to just let scripture, that, that's why I believe that theology informs our apologetics and not the other way around kind of going back kind of going back to kind of going back to the discussion of of how much you let your apologetics shape your theology no 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 it's got to be your theology shapes your apologetics 
and, and a good example of that is, I think I mentioned this Cardinal, uh, it's Avery Cardinal Doulis's book on the history of apologetics. It is an excellent history of apologetics and I, I highly recommend it. But the one flaw that I perceived as I read it is he didn't clearly define what Christianity was. So he couldn't really couldn't define who apologists were because he didn't know who was defending the Christian faith and who was attacking it. And that's why he had all sorts of crazy guys that he was listing as apologists, when in fact what they had done is they had completely reshaped Christianity and they defended their reshaping of it. Um, and, and we would consider, well, well, no, those guys are the enemies because <laughs> they're changing Christianity, right? But, and, and why did he get himself into that, in that conflict, in that, into that uh, trouble in his history of apologetics? Because he didn't define what Christianity was before he defined what it means to defend Christianity. That's why theology must presuppose apologetics. I think that you, well, you had a comment, again, I took notes on our conversation before, I thought it was great, you said something, be a theologian first, and, a theolo and, a, and an apologist second, um, knowing your theology as your foundation, and then that, that is the foundation or the formation of your apologetics. Um, so yeah, um, the, the, the temptation or the terror or the paradox of it all is that to be effective in your communication, it's the same problem as speaking or preaching, to be effective in your communication, you have to know the person that you're talking to and you have to be aware of what they're thinking and you have to anticipate their objections. So you are in the deepest way, very, very conscious of them. But if somehow your eye goes to that and you forget to keep your other eye on what it is that you're actually saying, then it distorts. Um, and somehow the, the paradox of it is like this challenge of at the same time thinking about them, thinking about their, the, the objections that are in their mind, trying to say things in a way that answer those objections. But at the end of the day, it's like, this is the message I'm gonna say. Like, this is the truth that I'm gonna communicate. Um, even if you don't like it, even if you hate me for it, this is just true. This is what I'm gonna say here. And I can't, yeah. I can't back off of that. Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Kind of, kind of going back to the analogy of two people having a conversation, one person is trying to defend you and one person who, who doesn't like you. If you had told that person, hey, if you, if you steal from me, again, I'm going to call the police or something like that. And then the, the other two people are having a conversation about that. And your friend says, he didn't really mean that. You know, he's, he's a really nice guy. He didn't mean that. It's like, no, I did. I really did. <laughs> you know, like, you, you're, you're, not, you're trying to present me for who, you should present me for who I am, not for what you think will make that person like me. I think that's what we can do with God. And we cannot do that with God. Because ultimately, it's, it's an, it will be ultimately an unattractive picture of God. God's justice and his mercy, his wrath and his love have to be presented in its fullness. Um, otherwise, it's not even compelling. People know deep down inside that, that evil must be met by justice. And, and they, know, they know deep down inside that there must be a God. If, this, if there's any sense of this world, there must be a God who will make everything right. Who in the end, as Ecclesiastes says, okay, God sees, God knows, he's going to bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or evil. Um, so. That's really solid. It, 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 uh, I mean, I'll just talk about one last thought and then we'll probably close it out here. I wouldn't want to get your feedback on this thought, but um, it takes me back mentally to, I put up that chart, you know, exegesis, biblical, systematic, and the whole stack um, and, and that kind of idea. We, we would talk about in missiology, an idea that you're not really ready to grapple with the hard cultural questions, the ethical questions in this culture and so forth until you really master the biblical information. Like you really know what does the Bible actually say and not say. Not what did I grow up with or what did I grow up thinking that the Bible said about this or that topic because that's just what I always heard. But like what does it actually say at its core? Um, I'm feeling like a sense of that with this also. It's like my, I will, my, my, the effectiveness of my apologetic may be a direct function, it may be a direct result of my actual rich, thorough, robust knowledge of biblical truth. And so that sometimes in my discussion, let's say, where I'm defending the Trinity, I could go it um, and just kind of like defend a model of Chalcedonian Christianity I pulled out of Wayne Grudem or something. But to really be able to defend it very effectively, there's no substitute for just knowing the text, like knowing all the relevant texts and knowing your way around and what you can say and what you can't say according to those texts and being constrained by them. So that yeah. apologetics drives me back to the Bible, which is a really great yeah. place to be driven back to. Thoughts there? Yeah. You know, yeah, I think that's true, totally true. And I don't often quote Karl Barth 
uh, you know, as my, as my homeboy or whatever. But uh, he, he did say something that I thought was really good. He said the, the best apologetic is a good dogmatic, dogmatics. So now that what, what he's saying is that, is that the, the strongest apologetic will be the strongest theology. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. So it doesn't mean that we throw, it doesn't mean that we collapse apologetics into theology, but it does mean that our apologetics will be only as strong as our theology is. Um, and, and whenever we try to water it down, we undermine both apologetics and, and theology. We think that we're doing people a favor, for instance, when we pull in Andy Stanley and say, ah, oh, gotta forget about the Old Testament. But man, we can't forget about the Old Testament. I mean, there, there can be some people whose idea of justice is so, and, and their hurt is so strong that they will only be convinced by a God who expresses complete rage against sin as the Old Testament depicts God. That, that, and if you unhinge, because of our, you know, kind of fluffy type of Christianity, and we like to think in terms of only happy, positive terms, but that's not realistic. So, yeah, I think we, we, our theology must inform our apologetics, and it's only, our apologetics is only as strong as our theology is. Which to step out there and make that comment from the Old Testament or to, to, to affirm the Old Testament with people that you expect to reject it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some strong confidence. Like this guy is going to have to really have some serious faith that God said it and therefore it's true and, and not back off. Um, which takes us full circle to the idea that like my effective apologetic to them probably began with an effective apologetic in here. If I don't actually believe white, white knuckle faith that the whole Old Testament and every word of scripture is there and it's not an accident. And all of that is sufficient to help this guy, even though I expect what I'm about to say next will drive him away. But I, I really can believe that God said it and it's, it's got a purpose. Um, that takes some serious faith, but I'm gonna have to fix this first to have that yeah. kind of confidence. It's great, yeah. really good. Um, I should let you go because uh, you know your wife uh, she's in the car with the engine running and your kids are all crying and uh, that moving truck is ready to roll. <laughs> Thank you. This is great. This is a really fun conversation. I wish we could keep on going, but we got to go. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. Um, any parting thoughts that we, we left here? Anything else we need to say? No, this is really fun. And it's been, it's a good opportunity to just uh, think about what apologetics is, but I, I would just, I would just stress the importance of apologetics for pastors and, and for the common person, it just whatever you do is first of all for yourself, because doubts come up in our minds. And, and secondly, just in the way we present the gospel, that we do it as faithfully and as compellingly as we can. If the gospel is, is true, which it is, it deserves the very best and most compelling way we could present it. And I think that's the best justification for apologetics I can think of. Awesome, excellent, great. Okay, we are thankful and grateful to hear from you one more time. So we'll look forward to that. Safe travels. Thank we'll you. see you in a new place. Um, Thank you. And <laughs> coming up on Thursday, we'll be back with Dr. Riley. We've heard from him before in a previous course. He'll be talking to us about theological foundation for apologetics. So uh, looking forward to that. I'll have homework up from him as soon as I, um, as I assume as I'm able to get that up. So I think Hopefully within the next 24 hours, you'll see that up on the Moodle page and you can get that downloaded. I'll give you a week for that as well. Remember the reading for today is due on Saturday. Make sure you get that in and take the, the it's just the quiz. All it is is a yes, no, you finished it out. Um, okay, Dr. Thrawfall, thank you again. We will look forward to seeing you in the future. Everyone else, we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks so much. Thank you.